Floor Amendment Number Eight by Ellis. Senator Ellis to explain Floor Amendment Number Eight. Thank you, Mr. President and members. This amendment may not be acceptable to the author, but if you give me a moment, I want to make sure that I explain it to you clearly. This amendment would direct the Department of Health and Human Services to provide medical assistance to all persons who apply uh, and for whom federal matching funds are available under the Affordable Care Act. The Health and Human Service Commissioner would adopt rules to implement this section. This amendment closes the current coverage gap and simply secures federal aid for what cities and counties pay for in our districts across the state now. The cost of uninsured Texans who show up in our doctor's offices and in emergency rooms is being paid for, but it costs a heck of a lot more than what we pay for it now. We could accept on a two-year basis $10 billion or over the next decade $10 billion in federal funding to address the gap uh, regarding affordable health care options for our constituents. And I think it's just common sense. I think in the discussion on the budget on yesterday, I think Dr. Shorten said clearly over half of the Health and Human Services budget today is federal money. I think the figure may have been about 63, 65 percent. Studies show just how good a good deal expanding Medicaid would be for Texans from 1.2 million to, to two, from 1.2 to 2 million Texans would get coverage. According to Dr. Perriman, Texas would see a return of $1.29 for every dollar spent on Medicaid expansion. And the burden on local governments would be reduced by $1.21 for every dollar the state spent on expanding the program. The Perriman re report also indicated that we get about 300,000 jobs for Texans per year on average over the next decade. Uh, Billy Hamilton, who many of us worked with for many years, his consulting uh, firm came up with a recommendation saying that Medicaid expansion would generate an estimated 231,000 jobs by 2016, several times that number in later years. Uh, I want to uh, make sure my colleagues know that 29 states already are moving forward with Medicaid expansion or implementing an alternative coverage program. The reason I'm offering an amendment is there are several bills uh, that are in various committees that I assume will never see the light of day. So uh, I hope that you'll find it in your hearts to give the roughly 2 million Texans. Most of them may be in, in my area, in the Houston area, in Harris County, but a good number of them are in your districts, and your counties are paying for them. So I hope that uh, you will look at this. This could either be on a two-year cycle, uh, which would cost considerably less in terms of the matching amount. I think I mentioned over a decade, uh, we would, we'd be able to draw down. We'd have to spend $4 billion over a decade to draw down $10 billion. Last session, I don't know the numbers for this session, but last session the figure was $50 million. We put up $50 million of the money from Texans and draw down uh, money for, I think it was about $10 billion. Uh, we, we draw down a billion dollars over a two-year cycle of Texans money from the federal government, just as we do for over half to other programs that are funded through the Health and Human Services Department. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or accept any co-sponsors. Senator West, for what purpose? A uh, question of uh, Senator Ellis. Senator Ellis, yield. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'll co-sponsor this with you. Okay. Uh, so put my name down as a co-sponsor. Let's talk about this for a few minutes. And I understand where Texas is on this issue, but we need to talk about it for a few minutes. Uh, Senator, are there other states that initially resisted going into the Affordable Care Act, affectionately known as Obamacare, S and then decided that they would? I've resisted giving it a name because, you know, I don't, I don't use the, the president's name because if that's what upsets some people, you know, we're coming up on the... The fact is, is that sometimes when you use the president's name and say uh, uh, Obamacare, people are uh, negative, and then when you, uh, as it relates to supporting the act, and then when you ask them, are they for the Affordable Care Act, they'll say that they are for the for Affordable well, Care Act, right? Senator, as you know, you and I are both glad that our kids who uh, have gone on to college and are no longer on our health insurance, we thank God, as do most members of this body, whose kids ended up with coverage... Uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, uh, but the, the provisions in the act are extremely Aren't there some popular. presidential uh, contenders that are considering 
uh, uh, coverage under the, the Affordable Care Act also? Yes, sir, including one from Texas. I'm just saying what the, what the media said. I don't know. But, you know, Senator, you raise a good point. In, in, in all seriousness, during the campaign cycle, I know those of us on our side of the aisle did as much as we could not to put our colleagues who were getting a lot of heat from their constituents behind the eight ball. At right. least I tried as much as I could to right. not make that issue a polarizing one, which is why I called this the Affordable Care Act. But, you know, even if sometimes people may consider it being facetious, you're talking about two million people in Texas who don't have access to health care because is they fall into the way Is there a way to do, make certain that they get access? Even on just a two-year cycle for $50 million, we draw down a billion dollars. Even, look, no matter how bad somebody is at math, Fifty million to draw down a billion is a pretty good. But the federal government return. doesn't have the money. Well, let me. Yeah, it's a good point, and we don't say that about transportation. None of us are turning down military uh, bases in our district that are funded by the federal government uh, because the federal government uh, may not have the money. The federal government is going to go broke. Well, it's it, and it is our money. By the way, you got me? It is, it is money coming from Texans. A disproportionate share of federal budget comes from Texas, California, New York, the big states. Senator, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, a good amendment. I, you probably don't have the votes to go on, but probably not. Okay. Well, I, look, let me tell you, it, but I mean, it, it breaks I, I my heart, but the people in California and in New York, they're saying Texas... It'll certainly be funded as long as we can take your, your citizens' tax dollars it and reminds, you don't get the health care. It reminds me, in terms of this issue, it reminds me of casinos. Everybody outside of the state of Texas is telling us inside the state of Texas we ought, to go, we ought, to go, we ought, we ought not do that. I and I'm pretty certain that the other me. states are doing the same things. <laughs> and, and so let me ask you this. As it relates to states that have changed their mind, did Arizona change its mind? As they it did. Relates to Arkansas is another good one, closer to us. Okay, in Arizona, Arkansas. Arkansas. Okay. I'm sorry, what? The Utah model, Utah has changed its mind. Uh, you know, so New Jersey, you know, may, maybe one of the prime presidential contenders uh, in the grand old party may be the current governor of New Jersey. What about Kentucky? Did Kentucky change its mind? I, I, I'd have to look at the list. I think they did. Okay. So, I'm not sure, but I think but so. I'm not going to. Uh, I know that you didn't expect me to ask these questions. I, had, I didn't expect to ask the question. It's just that it just hit me in the moment that I had to make certain I got I, up to ask you these questions. Senator, but I, I wish am, we could. I, am a co I will co author this amendment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator West. Senator Taylor of Collin, for what purpose? I wanted to ask the author a few questions. Senator Ellis Shield. My honor. Sure. Senator Ellis, you're a very, very able man. Uh, a terrific member of this body. In fact, I believe you're the only member of the state senate who's actually been lieutenant governor of Texas, which is uh, an impressive achievement. Um, when you laid this out... I'll always follow your lieutenant governor. <laughs> I am. Watch me. Uh, as you laid o this only, out... Only one lieutenant governor will be voting on this amendment today, I, though. I appreciate that. Uh, in the, unless it's a tie. Um, as you laid this out, I, I was just sort of... It, it, it struck me that there was sort of a lack of, of, of examples. Um, and so, a, as I understand it, there are four states that in the early 2000s did Medicaid expansion. Uh, are, are you familiar with those states? Do you know what happened there? Is no, that, no, no, oh, I'm not sure which states you're referring to. Okay, well, so the state of Maine, the state You mean of, under the Affordable Care Act, under the initial, you know, no, we're on so, the 50th anniversary right. of Medicaid. So in 2000, the state of Maine, around 2000, the state of Maine, state of Arizona, the state of, the state of Delaware, and the state of Oregon, those four states did Medicaid expansion. They, add, they added into the eligible pool under Medicaid uh, able-bodied able women, and, uh, men and women who were not eligible, for, eligible under the uh, Medicare program. Yes. Um, and so, so we have four examples of what Medicaid expansion could look like. Are you, I mean, does this sound familiar to you, or would you it, let it, me do it? It does. Oh, I take one closer. Oh, you, you tell me in, in the form oh, of the question. Right, sure. So, so of those four states, and I, actually, let's just go to Arizona. Uh, they actually had a plebiscite. They, they, they had a proposition, Prop 204, which uh, made Medicaid expansion legal uh, in the state of Arizona. And they hoped, they thought that they would, they would and I assume that you want Medicaid expansion. You want Medicaid expansion. This well, that's what this is. It's a Medicaid expansion. Sure, but you want that in order to uh, in order to reduce 
the percentage of the population in the state of Texas that does not have health care coverage. Is that right? I do. Okay. So in the state of Arizona, uh, when they expanded it, over a decade, their uninsured population did not change. Even though their Medicaid percentage went up, their private health care went down. And so they literally, they began, I believe, at 19% or 18%, and they ended up at 19% or 18%. But it literally was flat throughout well, that decade. Well, despite let me give you, the fact, let me give you a guess. I, I, actually, despite the fact that the state of Arizona in 2000, when they actually sat down and said, let's do Medicaid expansion, and the people of Arizona voted on it, and they made a decision that's not the decision, decision that you would have made. Not the decision I would make, but the decision that you would have made to expand Medicaid. And what, what ended up happening was, is the cost was extraordinary. In 2000, they estimated that the cost of Medicaid expansion in the state of Arizona in 2010, so they kind of projected 10 years out, would be $600 million. And it was not $600 million. It wasn't $1.2 billion. It wasn't $1.8 billion. It was $2.4 billion. They were off 300%. So, and furthermore, I assume, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you hope that this amendment will cover more people, and I also assume that you want Medicaid expansion for the simple fact that it will reduce uncompensated care. Is, it, is that a correct That's assumption? part of it. Okay. So in the state of Arizona, uncompensated care grew almost 150% over a one-decade period. So Medicaid expansion, at least in the state of Arizona and the state of Oregon and the state of Delaware and in, in, the, in the state of Maine, the four states that did Medicaid expansion starting in 2000 in this, in this country failed to achieve the policy objectives that you want to achieve with this amendment. So let me ask you, knowing that it doesn't work, having facts, why would we do this? Why does this make any sense at all? Would you like a response? Yes, sir. Yes, Senator. I think if you want to compare Arizona, Arkansas, Maine, any of those early states that you made reference to, I would encourage you to do that. I would even go to Arizona with you uh, uh, at as soon as uh, convenient time to go and, and look. I'm assuming if you ended up with more cost in Arizona, it's because that state, similar to ours, is one that attracts a lot of people. And so you can't just look at what the cost ended up being. You've got to look at what the cost would have been if they had not done the expansion. Look, I'd even be willing to give you all a way out of the dilemma uh, that a at least a number of my friends, not on this floor, but a number of my friends in the Grand Old Party have found themselves in. You can let this go to the voters. I'm saying appropriate the $50 million. Do it for two years. And if it doesn't work, drop out or go ahead and appropriate enough money to draw down the 15 billion. You know, we're the fastest growing state in the country. We're probably going to continue to be the fastest growing state in the country. If one of us were to have an accident tomorrow night when we adjourn and go home, they have to get on the computer to figure out what, what emergency room to take us to because there's so many Texans who are in emergency rooms because they don't have health care, and it may not be an emergency, but they don't know that. So all I'm saying is, don't worry about the additional costs. If you just appropriate the $50 million, the federal government can only get whatever the state says it's going to give. And you can deal with those other issues along the way. That's why I'm not trying to design a program here on the floor of the Senate. I'm giving that power to the experts who would put it together the Health and Human Services Commission. But look, the short answer is none of those states have pulled out. None of the states that you are making reference to, and you know what, you ought to go back and check. I'm willing to bet none of our friends in those states on either side of the aisle lost their seats in the State House or the State Senate. I know the governor decided not to run. I don't think it's gonna be a, a, a issue uh, for the presidential contenders the one in the grand old party, if he decides to run because he did the Medicaid expansion in his state. You know, there was a lot of talk about what we would do in Texas to address the large population of uninsured people. But my friend, nada, nothing has been done to address that uninsured population in Texas. And as people of faith with tremendous values, all I'm saying is, I'm going to ask for a vote on this because I am not going to turn my back on two million people 
many in your part of the state, not just mine, who don't have access to health care. You heard the discussion yesterday. Over half that Health and Human Services budget comes from the federal government. We don't care about any other federal program going bankrupt, even if I were to say there's some credence to your argument there. Look, you know, you ought to go back. You ought to, I, I should take you over to that LBJ library. A lot of those folks who fought President Johnson, a Texan, might I add, on Medicaid and Medicare, on the wall, who fought him, are the first ones who want to protect those programs. You ought to look at the history. You know what, the reason they passed it for the elderly first, when they had difficulty getting votes from Southern Democrats and some Republicans in the United States Senate, is because the older people would vote. So they put them in first. And then later on, over time, they decided to go ahead and do coverage for the poor. But I'm, I, just, I just want us to just back away from the political corners that we put ourselves in. I've done it. You know, my 31 years, a lot of things I said when I was running, and when I figured out that they were nuts, I figured out how to get out of that box. <laughs> and I'm just saying, I'm trying to give us an opportunity to get out of this box and give these deserving Texans an opportunity to have health care. And since I can't do it, the straight up way I'd like to do it with a bill, because the argument is just so one-sided, in my favor, to be honest with you, nobody even hears the bills. They don't even have a hearing on it. All of your hospitals in your district, I bet every hospital in your district, if they won't say it publicly, you call them and ask them privately. Do they think we ought to take this money? They'll tell you yes. And, and again, what strikes me about what you've just said is I gave you four examples of Medicaid expansion being a failure, not insuring more people, costing a lot more money, driving up uncompensated care, and you can't refute the examples because they're fact. And, and, and one thing you said... Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with your examples. I think you have that wrong. And so my response is Whoa. none of those states pulled out. Okay. I think your colleagues are saying, you, hey, you can't win it on the merits, but if you had the votes, just go ahead and take the votes. No, I, I, there's no question in my mind that the example in history is on the side of not expanding Medicaid because everywhere it's been done, it's failed. Well, would you go back and abolish the Medicaid program those past 50 years? What, would you get rid of Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, by the way? This is, this is Medicaid expansion. It's failed in four states, and it's not going to be tried here. Well, I respect your, your position. Thank you. I'll move for adoption. Uh, Senator Menendez, for thank our purpose. You. Uh, Mr. President, would the gentleman yield for some questions? You yield, Senator yes, sir, Ellis. gladly. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Uh, Senator, is it, is it not true that almost every hospital, they've put together a group called the Texas Way to address this issue of the expansion of Medicaid in Texas? Is that not true? It is true, Senator, and they have been very diplomatic about trying to avoid uh, getting any of our colleagues uh, behind the eight ball on this issue. Well, because uh, isn't that true that eight, almost 80 percent of Texans are uninsured? Is that not the case? What's that figure? I couldn't 80, hear. Is it that echo. 80 percent? Is it not almost 80 percent? I'm not sure of the exact number. I thought it was more like about a third. A third. All right. So well, my, the figures that I'm looking at, the myth versus fact, the Texas way, my understanding, and I'm not sure if you'd be surprised by this, that if we were to draw down and expand Medicaid, that we would alleviate the cost of covering uninsured, which currently is, re is resulting in an $1,800 a year in higher health insurance premiums to those of us who are paying for health insurance. That's a good point. I, ha I hadn't thought about that because obviously when people don't have, he have health insurance, they wait until maybe the health problem is more critical because they're not taking the preemptive steps and we all, we all pay for that. Well, we, we pay for it because of many of our hospitals, they obviously, when someone shows up at the emergency room, they, they have to take them, don't they? Premiums, our insurance rates, as well as taxes. Correct. And so that's the other question that I have. Did you know that uh, if we were to accept this and expand Medicaid, we would reduce the tax burden on local property owners who pay for county indigent health care service by a billion dollars in Texas? I, I do know we would reduce that local tax burden in terms of insurance rates, that's a more complicated issue. You know, we do very little regulation of insurance rates in Texas. I mean, that's a, so that's, that's a much more complicated issue in terms of 
the, the rates that but we pay in insurance. people who show up at the county or, the, or the, the, the hospitals in our districts, uncompensated care, the taxpayers at the local level are paying for that. Is that not the case? That's correct. And so the taxpayers have to pay for it in, the, in their property taxes. That is correct. So. It's property you, tax relief. I hadn't thought of that. This, yeah. is, a, this is a property tax a relief. A billion I mean, dollars worth of property tax relief. And I know that this is, we're all in support of property tax relief, is what I've heard. So did you know that if we expanded, that we would provide a tool for 48,900 veterans to access health insurance benefits? Did you know that? Now, Senator, I was about to make reference to veterans earlier when I was talking and our distinguished colleague, Senator Taylor, and you know, uh, all of us owe a tremendous debt uh, to those women and men who have served this, this country. And that, that is a very important point. Thank you for bringing it up. If we were to expand this, did you know that we would eliminate almost $400 million in tax penalties for employers, business people who can't afford to provide health insurance for their employees? That's an excellent point. So I, to me, it seems like if we do follow your lead and we just commit to the two years that you said, like a pilot program, if you will, that we draw down federal tax dollars that are our taxes. I mean, wasn't there a time when Texans were mad that we were a contributor for highway tax dollars, we weren't drawing down enough money, wasn't there? Senator, it, it's, it's such a good point, and, and you know, and when I add to that analogy, most of the Health and Human Services budget, over half of it, is federal money right now. And so that logic that some people apply, we don't want to draw it down because the program may go financially into bankruptcy, right. they don't apply that to the rest of that Health and Human Services budget. So the tax dollars that we're refusing to accept, our money from the federal government, they're going to subsidize other states. Is that not the case? They're helping to keep the Affordable Care Act uh, alive in other states. And as, as you know, you've probably seen the press accounts, the federal government may put more pressure on uh, those states that don't draw down the money uh, by not granting certain waivers that uh, some states like Texas have been able to get in the, in the past. I mean, there's going to be even more pressure on our hospitals well, if seems, we don't draw this money down. It seems to me that in doing this, we help people who don't have insurance. We help employers who can't afford to provide insurance benefits. We provide property tax relief for those of us who are paying for the people who show up to the county hospitals without insurance. So we're being good fiscal stewards of our taxpayers in the state of Texas if we were to do what you're asking us to do. Is that not the case? Senator's right. We help veterans. We help on property tax relief. We lower tax rates uh, to our counties and our cities. We, we don't end up in a position where, like in Harris County, because they do have a hospital district surrounding counties and cities, just send their, their folks who need access to health care to the Harris County Hospital District. You know, I always, it's a good thing. You and I are both lawyers, and I sometimes have made reference to the fact that doctors took a Hippocratic oath. Well, and, and so they serve people. You know, lawyers sometimes can be a little hypocritical. We don't, we, don't all, we don't do it if somebody's poor. I appreciate the promotion, but I, I did not go to law school. But, but I do want to say that I believe that everyone in this room wants to do what's best for the 26 million Texans that we represent. And so I think that in doing this, especially doing it the way you're asking, you know, if we can't get a bill passed to just do it all in, Let's do a two-year pilot expansion program. Let's just put the $50 million up. Let's get all those billions of dollars back home that are our dollars. Let's give people a medical home where children can go to a doctor and get a simple antibiotic instead of having to present at the emergency room with double pneumonia. Let's and, do the right thing. And Senator, so I'd even take it to the voters. I mean, there are enough, a number of financial schemes or ideas that some of our colleagues have to divert certain funds, uh, change the way we determine what the spending cap is, and submit that to the voters. I'm convinced, even if the voters will give an opportunity to make a decision on drawing down this money, without the state spending any money on a voter campaign, when they look at these numbers and say for uh, you know, a relatively small amount of money, you can draw down $50 million to draw down $4 billion. You know, I, I think the voters would do that in a, in a minute. Or the idea of putting up $15 billion to draw down $100 billion.
billion dollars B over, over a decade, I think that they do it. So I'd even accept that as a friendly amendment. If, if it's the only way our colleagues can let this pass, let the voters decide. Senator, I, one, I'd like to ask to be a co-sponsor or co-author, whatever the t proper terminology is on your amendment. But also, if, if it would require that amendment, I'd, I'd also like to help with that amendment as well. I want to thank you for bringing this forward because I think it's important that the people of the state of Texas know that we, we're trying hard to do the right thing. Sometimes it's difficult to, to express it because we, you know, sometimes the bills that we like to, to present sometimes don't get a chance to, to get heard. Well, thank I'm, you. I'm hoping I can get one of our colleagues from the Grand Old Party. Come one, come all. No takers? Senator Nelson. Senator Ellis, I absolutely share your interest in improving access to care. We share that interest. I respectfully disagree that expanding Medicaid is the best way to go about that. We've had discussion today. We had discussion in our budget debate. I will point out there are many things that we are doing right now to promote access, expanding women's health, supporting FQHCs, improving mental health. Um, I also understand that you have filed a Senate bill that would do exactly what this amendment does. Um, and as you well know, this is outside the scope of Sunset Review. So at this time, Mr. President, um, the amendment is not acceptable to the author, and I will move to table the amendment. Senator Ellis, to close. Members, every once in a while, you have to make a decision based on what you think is best for your political career or what's best for the people that you were elected to represent. Now, you know, we can dance around it as much as we want to, but the harsh reality is where Texas ranks right now, today, in terms of the percentage of people who are uninsured, is exactly where we're going to be two years from now. And I'd be more than willing to find some language I suggested, letting the voters decide. I, don't use the, I didn't use the president's name when I laid it out. But some issues really go beyond the narrow prism of what's in our best political interest. And I may be naive. I've seen it on maybe about five bills during my 25 years of being here. One was a hate crimes bill, where people would get all whipped up into a frenzy, as though if they voted for it, it would get them defeated. And it took a decade for the bill to pass. It might have come up in one or two House races, but nobody in this Senate lost their seat over that bill. And nobody in this Senate is going to lose their seat because you vote or change this language to let the people of Texas vote on whether or not two million Texans, people who look just like us, some of them are veterans, get access to health care. There's nothing that we are going to pay to do with tax dollars that we control in Texas to ensure two million people. We're not going to do it. Hey, there were a lot of people who were on the wrong side of history in the U.S. Senate in both parties when they passed Social Security. Be interesting to go back and, and go through that debate and look at it when it passed. Being a big fan of LBJs, I read all this stuff on LBJ. A whole lot of those folks that voted against Medicaid and Medicare were on the wrong side of history. And if they could go back and change it, they would do that. It's a matter of simply giving people access to health care. So I would respectfully ask you to vote no on my distinguished chairwoman's uh, motion to table this uh, amendment. Thank you. Members, the question is on the motion to table the amendment from Senator Ellis. The secretary would call the roll. Betancourt, Birdwell, Burton, Campbell, Creighton, Ellis, Eltife, Estes, Frazier, Garcia, Hall, Hancock, 
Inahosa, Hafines, Huffman, Colcourse, Lucio, Menendez, Nelson, Nichols, Perry, Rodriguez, Schwertner, Seliger, Taylor of Galveston, Taylor of Collin, Uresti, Watson, West, Whitmire, Zaffarini. There being 20 ayes and 11 nays, the amendment is tabled.